Before I read the, the text this morning, I want to apologize, first of all, because I'm going to be reading it from, a, <laughs> from another version. Maybe some of you have it. The reason, because I forgot to copy the text into my notes, okay? So, and I also forgot to bring my Bible with me. So, anyway, I'm, I'm using um, the ESV. It's terrible. I'm getting older. That's why you see me looking up here. Do I have everything? Do I have everything? And even after I go through the list, I've still missed something. Okay, so ESV should make sense. Uh, maybe some of you have the ESV. That's what the Reformation Study Bible, the version it's in. But it should agree with the NASB if that's what you're reading from also. And so this is what Paul writes uh, by the inspiration again of the Holy Spirit. Let's remember this is God's Word, Romans 10, verses 1 through 10. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. Again, talking about the Jews. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, Do not say in your heart, Who will ascend into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the abyss? That is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is, the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Well, may the Lord bless his uh, word to our understanding uh, this morning. Now, last week, remember, Paul showed us something more about this Israel that is not descended from Israel, that it also includes Gentiles. And again, remember what encouragement that would be for the Church of Rome, which is primarily Gentile, and what an encouragement it is for us, because Gentiles, remember, are non-Jews. So everybody who is not a Jew is a Gentile. Now, that it shouldn't have come as a surprise to that, I should say, that shouldn't have come as a surprise to the Roman believers if they had known the Old Testament. The Lord revealed that it was His plan to save them through the prophets. Remember that those who were not His people would one day be called His people. That eventually all the families of the nations would worship before Him, as we see in Psalm 22. That this would be the Son's reward uh, that the Father would give Him for His work. So it shouldn't have been a surprise that Gentiles are included, neither that all the Jews would also not be saved. That shouldn't have been surprising because God, though He promised to give Abraham as many children as the sand of the sea, which He did, He only said a remnant of them would be saved. That's something we need to remember. Otherwise, we're going to misunderstand what the Lord is going to say later with Paul, through, through the Apostle Paul and what he's already told us, remember, they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. Now, this is why Jesus, during his ministry, remember, said to the Jews, many are called. I mean, they are all called, but few are chosen. See, he was reflecting that remnant principle, even in his ministry, and also why he warned them in the Sermon on the Mount. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction and there are many who enter through it, for the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. You know, we often quote that verse and think about it in terms of the world, okay? I mean, yeah, there's a lot in the world that are going on the broad road of destruction and only a few that find the path of life, but Jesus said this to the Jews. They were the church of God. They were the children of Abraham. They were the ones descended from Israel. And he was saying that only a few of them were actually going to find the path of life and enter through the narrow gate. Now, Paul went on to explain from a human perspective 
why God was saving the Gentiles and why the Jews were being excluded. And the, the, the point was because the Gentiles were receiving the gospel. Okay? They were believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and receiving God's free gift of righteousness through faith where the Jews were trying to earn it through their works. Okay? We need to trust Jesus alone for our salvation and not in our works. Only He can give us the righteousness that justifies. But it's really that last point that Paul wants to delve into a little bit more deeply this morning, why it is the Jews failed to submit to the righteousness of, of God, why they failed to receive Jesus Christ. He's basically pointing out that they should have known. They should have known this from the Scriptures. You know how the the apostles are always quoting from the Old Testament to prove the New Testament doctrine. It's because the New Covenant was revealed in the Old Covenant, something the Jews should have seen. So this morning, what he's doing is he's going to quote Moses because you know, the Jews respect Moses to show that Moses had warned them against trusting in their works and had pointed them to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, through the text that I read earlier in Deuteronomy chapter 30. Now, he begins by again expressing his desire for their salvation. He, he began the last chapter in the same way. But here, he doesn't do it quite as strongly as he did in chapter 9. Remember, he said there he would willingly be condemned if through his damnation it would save them. Now, he doesn't go quite that far, but he still shows a great deal of love and concern for them because he wanted his countrymen, his family, to be saved. It was for this that he earnestly and constantly prayed, and by the way, also witnessed to them tirelessly, regardless of the persecution he received from them. Now, think about, again, those that we care about, okay? Think about those that are members of our family, think about our own children who don't know the Lord, and because of that are in danger of, in every moment of being lost forever. Think about your concern for them and how you want them to know Jesus, how you pray that God would change their hearts. You see, this is what Paul wanted for the Jews because they were his family. Again, even though they hated him, even though they persecuted him, and again, sometimes don't our family members, sometimes our children hate us for telling them the truth. He still loved them. He still prayed for them. He was here showing that he had the heart of the Lord Jesus Christ towards them. Remember, Jesus also did the same thing, and he left us this example to follow. Now, the Jews had a zeal for God, Paul says. They were trying to serve him, you know, like Paul also was before he was converted but their zeal was not according to knowledge. They really didn't understand what God had done for them through the Lord Jesus Christ, which is why they were persecuting the church, why they were persecuting Paul, because they thought that he was really opposed to God. Now, some say that it doesn't really matter what you believe as long as you believe it sincerely. Well, that isn't true because the Jews believe what they believe sincerely, and it certainly mattered to God, didn't it? He called them to repent and believe the truth. We must believe the truth. But not knowing about God's righteousness, the righteousness which He provides in the Lord Jesus Christ and seeking to establish their own righteousness through their obedience, through their keeping of the law, Paul says they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God, which means they would not receive Christ and the free gift of righteousness that He provides in Christ. You know, there is a submission that is involved in receiving Christ. The, the gospel is not just an offer. The, the gospel is a command, isn't it? Repent and believe, trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, which includes within it, obey the Son. You know, and the obedience He calls us is to receive Him, and then out of the love He provides to follow Him and to serve Him with all of our heart. Now, he, he says this, and this is really the, the point, I think, of the whole text, but certainly of this first section. For, Paul writes in verse 4, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. 
Now, I've already pointed out earlier in, in the service that he's not saying by this that once we come to the Lord Jesus Christ, that we no longer need to obey him. That, that's how some people interpret this text. Again, I came from a college that had some really strange beliefs. Still evangelical, but they were trying to eliminate the need to obey him and turning repentance into simply a change of mind. Well, Paul isn't saying here, once we come to Christ, that's the end of the law. We no longer have to keep the law, you know, in order to um, either be saved. Of course, we never had to keep the law to be saved in a certain sense. But not even to honor the Lord. Now, we do set it aside as far as justification. You know, we, we don't look at the law and say, this is what the Lord calls me to be. This is what I'm aspiring to be. This is what I can't be, you know. The law does have that purpose, to show us that we need the Lord Jesus Christ. But we need to remember that Jesus came into the world to give us the power to obey the law of God in order to love the Lord as He also did. What Paul means here when he says Christ is the end of the law is that Christ is the purpose behind the law. He was the goal behind it. It's, it's what the law was pointing to in every way. The reason why God gave us the moral law was to point us to Jesus by showing us that our, 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 you know, our sins, that we couldn't measure up so that we would see our need for Him. But now that He has fulfilled it, we look to Jesus for the righteousness that we need, the righteousness that He earned according to the law. We are saved by His works. The reason why God gave the ceremonial law was also to point us to Christ because remember, the wages of sin is death. He was showing us through the ceremonial law that that was true, but that God was providing a substitute, a sacrifice to be made on our behalf so that we wouldn't die. He was pointing again to the Lord Jesus Christ through the, the, the ceremonial law. And now that Jesus has sacrificed himself on the cross, we look to him for that forgiveness. So what Paul is saying here is if, if the Jews had believed in Jesus, if they had trusted him, their sins would have been washed away, would have been cleansed. Their nakedness would have been clothed. And again, that nakedness with regard to their righteousness. They had none. They were naked. They would have been clothed with the robes of his righteousness, the only righteousness God would accept, and they would have been justified. But Paul's point is, they didn't, which is why he's continuing to pray for them and seeking for their salvation. Now, in this next section, Paul goes on to tell us that the Jews should have known this. They should have known the gospel. They should have known it was a matter of trust and faith, a matter of the heart, a matter of confession, and not a matter of works. And they should have known that through Moses. Now, he begins by saying Moses warned them against trying to justify themselves through the law. Quoting Leviticus 18.5, and remember when, you, when they're talking about Moses, they're talking about the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, okay? So here he quotes Leviticus 18.5, and Paul writes this, For Moses writes that the man who practices the righteousness which is based on law shall live by that righteousness. And what he means by that is not, if he practices it, this is the way he's going to live, but if he's going to practice this, this is the way he's going to gain eternal life. So what Paul is saying is that what Moses was saying, this, do you want God to accept you on the basis of your works and of your performance? Then you need to be perfect. If you are, then you will live. I don't know if you ever thought about this, but theoretically, you know, God would have accepted us. God would have justified us if... We could have been conceived and born without sin. If we had kept the law perfectly from the time of our birth to the time of our death, and to have done that not only in the way that we conducted ourselves, but also in our thoughts and in our desires. In other words, if we had lived like Christ, <laughs> we would be just. I mean, Jesus lived that perfect life and God justified him, not just for, uh, for him, but for us. He declared him to be just because he was, in fact, just. But that isn't our situation, is it? We were conceived in sin, as Paul pointed out in, in Romans chapter 5, when Adam sinned. 
we all sinned in him. And we have done nothing but sin from the time we were born. Okay, maybe not always in our actions. I mean, as a as, a, as an infant, it's, it's hard to sin, but you've got to remember that as an infant, we still have within our hearts corruption, which means a hatred of God. Infants hate God. I don't know if you've ever thought about that, uh, but, but it is the case because that is the result of sin. So maybe you know, it wasn't always the things we were doing. Maybe we did some of the right things. There were times when we were obeying God's commandments. Even unbelievers can do that. But we never did it in our thoughts and in our desires. That's where the unbeliever falls short, right? They don't love God, and they're not doing these things for His glory. Now, that's the reason why the law can't save us. That's the reason why the law only condemns us. And we see that over and over again in Scripture. Paul writes to the Galatians in Galatians 3, verse 10, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things, written in the book of the law to perform them. And again, he's saying you want to justify yourselves through your own works. Well, if you don't keep it perfectly, if you don't abide by everything written in that book, then you're cursed. It brings the curse upon you. And that would be if you didn't already have it. You know, we, we already do have the curse as we come into the world because we're cursed in Adam. And we brought it down on ourselves many times. But Paul's point here is not to condemn us, but simply to show us that we will be condemned if we go down that road. But he says, thankfully, God in his mercy provided another way. Moses also pointed to this, and this is where we have to put our thinking caps on to understand what he's saying. Paul writes in verses 6 through 8, in ASB, but the righteousness based on faith speaks as follows. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead? But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we are preaching. Now here he's quoting from that passage that I read earlier. Deuteronomy 30 verses 11 through 14. Let me read it again so you can see the similarity. Moses writes this. For this commandment which I command you today is not too difficult for you, nor is it out of reach. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will go up to heaven for us to get it for us and make us hear it that we may observe it. Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will cross the sea for us to get it for us and make us hear it that we may observe it. But the word is very near you, in your mouth and in your heart, that you may observe it. Now, I, let me submit to you that, that what Moses is referring to here is the gospel, and he's not talking about legalism. As a matter of fact, there were times when Moses would issue that challenge. Here are the commandments. You want to try to be good enough for God? Try to keep them. But Moses was not advocating that's the way they should go. He was warning them against that, but advocating trusting in the Lord's Messiah. And he's doing that here as well. But again, remember, it's veiled in Old Testament terminology. It's not as clear as we have it. You know, but Paul's going to make it clear. Now, the first thing we need to ask is, what is he talking about here with regard to this commandment? What is this commandment that's not too difficult? Well, commentators believe that he's referring here to the commandment given in chapter 6 of Deuteronomy. The same commandment that Jesus tells us is the great and the foremost commandment because it summarizes all the commandments. And I think it's a safe bet to say, yes, that's it, because it really encompasses everything God calls us to do. And that is in Deuteronomy 6, verse 5, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. This commandment isn't out of reach. You don't have to ascend to heaven to ask God. You don't have to cross the sea to discover it. They knew what God wanted. The word was very near. Moses had told them. Okay, God had declared it to them through Moses. But he also says this, it's not too difficult. Not too difficult. Okay. What does he mean by that? Okay. Well, we know that apart from God's grace, even with God's grace, okay, it's impossible 
to do this, to love him in this way, I would venture to say, you know, knowing, knowing my own heart, but again, I'm not the standard, the Bible is, that none of us have loved the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, even for one moment. But I would also say, with God's grace, at least we were able to do it to some degree. But what does Moses mean when he's talking about this in an Old, Cove in old Covenant context? Well, again, to understand this, we need to remember that these verses follow on the heels of verses 1 through 10, where he is talking about the New Covenant. Since I read them earlier, I'm not going to read them again, but let me just point out a couple of things. In these verses, remember, Moses, first of all, is looking forward to the time when Israel is going to break the covenant. He says the blessings are going to come. There is going to be a time when you are going to obey and God's going to bless you. And we know those times did come under uh, David in particular and uh, then Solomon. But then after that, it all fell apart, didn't it? The curses would also come and they would be banished from the land. How would you like you know, a prophet to tell you you're going to fail and your children are going to fail? and you're going to be banished. But that's exactly what he's telling them, and that's exactly what happened. And we know from the Old Testament, the northern kingdom was the first to be banished by Assyria, and they were scattered through all the nations. And then the southern kingdom, secondly, suffered three deportations to, to Babylon. So Moses is talking about that, but then he looks beyond that to the time of God's mercy. In those places where he will have banished them, they would remember, he said, this would happen. They would again turn to him and obey him with all their hearts. He would gather them back into the land because in verse 6 of Deuteronomy 30, he would circumcise their hearts to love him. By the way, that only means one thing. That means conversion. It's the Old Testament way of talking about, you know, the washing of regeneration of the Holy Spirit, the way it's referred to in the New Covenant. Moses is speaking here about the blessings of the new covenant, that God would give them his spirit through the work of his Messiah that would empower them to keep the great commandment to love God. Now, that is how Paul explains what Moses is saying here. But he does rephrase it just a bit in new covenant language. To receive God's grace, to give you the power to love, you don't have to do the impossible. And that's what, that's what this language means, going up to heaven, going across the sea, going down into the abyss. He's talking about things that are impossible for us to do, okay? It's not impossible to do this. You don't have to do the impossible. You don't have to ascend into heaven, Paul says, to bring Christ down. In other words, to, to get him to send the Messiah into the world because God has already sent him into the world. Now, he's telling the Roman believers this. They know that. They know that God sent the Messiah, but he's saying that this is for the Jews. They need to understand. It's not impossible. Okay? God has sent his Messiah into the world, and you don't have to descend into the abyss to bring Christ up from the dead. Now, here Paul is using his apostolic authority to change the wording here just a bit to bring out the gospel meaning. But in the Old Testament, what Moses said is you don't have to cross the deep Paul is saying you don't have to descend into the deep. God has already raised the Christ from the dead. He sent him into the world. He obeyed. He died. And he raised him from the dead. So what do you need to do? He says the word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. What word? Not the command, you know, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. But the means to keep that command. The means by which God will circumcise your hearts. The word of faith, which we are preaching, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Okay, for with the mouth one confesses, resulting in salvation. With the heart one believes, resulting in justification. Okay. Now, what is Paul saying here? Because this is also a very misunderstood passage. First of all, we need to understand he's using this language because he's pointing to what Moses said. That's why he talks about confessing and believing. But that is, in fact, what we need to do. Now, what he's not saying here, and this is the way many interpret this, that if we simply say, Jesus is Lord, we're saved. You know, the magic three words, Jesus is Lord. Just say that, and you will be saved. 
Jesus tells us in Matthew 7 in the Sermon on the Mount, verses 22 and 23, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we do this? Didn't we do that? And he will say, I will declare to them, I never knew you. So it's not enough to call him Lord. What Paul means is we need to say it and mean it and do it. Submit to his lordship. You know, I keep, you keep hearing surfacing from the past this lordship controversy. You know, John MacArthur was embroiled in and he was saying, hey, you know, if you're going to receive Jesus as Savior, you need to submit to him as Lord. And you know what? He was right. But there's a lot of people who think that he's wrong and that, that still lingers to the present day. No, it's not enough to say he is Lord, to recognize his lordship. We also need to submit to him, to obey him. As the one who has absolute authority over our lives. Now, how can we do that? We can only do it by the grace he supplies. Why do we do that? Because we want to. Because we love him. That, that's, that's what the new covenant blessing is all about. The circumcision of the heart. That's the reason why we will say he is Lord and mean it and submit to him is because we love him. And Paul is also not telling us that if we believe that Jesus or God raised Jesus from the dead, that we will be justified. Again, that's the way it's interpreted. But G James tells us, remember in James 2 verse 19, the demons believe, that the devil believes that God raised Jesus from the dead. They know it and they shudder, but they're not saved. We need to believe it from the heart. We need the faith that works by love. But remember, that is also provided in the Lord Jesus Christ, the kind of faith that justifies. Now, this is what the Jews didn't understand, and that's why they tried to earn their own righteousness. And ultimately, the reason why Paul has already told us in Romans chapter 9. Ultimately, the reason why they were doing this and the reason why they didn't see it is because God had not opened their eyes to see it. And again, think about yourself. You know, put yourself back in time without the New Testament reading what we just read. Would you understand what was said there? Well, those whom the Lord had chosen saw Christ. Remember how Jesus said to the Jews regarding Abraham, Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it was glad. He rejoiced. He saw it because God opened his eyes. He saw it through the old covenant. He saw it through the promises. He saw it through the prophecies. He saw it through the types that God gave. All these pictures and those who truly believed in the Lord saw it in the sacrifices that were being made and they saw it in the priesthood and they saw it in the office of king and they saw it in the office of prophet. They saw Christ everywhere the one God was going to send. Well, again, God had not opened their eyes. They are not all Israel who were descended from Israel, only a remnant. But this is the reason why the rest of them did not, is because God did not open their eyes. So think about that for a moment and think about what a blessing it is that God has opened our eyes because we were blind. We could not give ourselves sight. If we're trusting in Jesus this morning, it's because... God has opened our eyes, and if he has opened our eyes, he has also given us the ability to keep the great commandment, to love the Lord our God with all of our heart and soul and might. Now, that might worry some of us because we look at our lives and we see that we don't do that, okay? Now, we may not be able to do it perfectly because there is sin in our hearts, but we can substantially. We can consistently because of the Spirit's work within our lives. And you see, it's that love of the Holy Spirit that we constantly need to be working on to try to cause it to grow through the means that God has given to us. And one of those means, of course, is the Lord's table. One of those means is the Word of God. I hope as I've been expounding this and speaking about God's grace and mercy and love, that the Lord has used that to encourage that love within your hearts, to show you His love towards you. He wants us, as we come to the table, to meditate on His great love for us through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And His purpose behind it is that we might love Him more deeply, that we might serve Him also 
more fervently. Let's not forget that's the reason why the Lord redeemed us in the first place is that we might love Him, we might reflect the image of His Son, that we might serve Him, and that we might, as a part of the church, participate in the great commission that He has given to us. So let's think about the great privilege that we have to be on this side of the equation. You know, that God has given us grace and He has opened our eyes and we're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. And let's pray as we come to the table that He would strengthen that love that we have that we might serve Him more earnestly. Let, let's pray.